So, in the mid-70s, when we start pulling away the welfare state and we're going to what's called residualism, then we start seeing rhetorical expressions of concern about carers. We start getting legislation, and, and this is sort of some of it, which comes along, carers this, carers that, carers the others. Carers get lots of mentions. And they get mentions because I think neoliberal states realise that they've got to say honeyed word about carers because they know that they are beginning as a group to be under this double whammy. They're being pushed into work, but they're also being forced to provide more care. And, of course, people are living care longer, so you know, many of us are caring. You know, I mean, my wife and I are caring for our elderly parents, and we've got five grandchildren, you know, and their mums are in work. You know, tell it, you know, we all know those sort of situations. And we're paying for their mortgages. <laughs> Don't get me going. Um, uh, so, um, you know, we, th that's becoming quite a big issue, I think. It's not working for carers. So we get this spate of legislation. Now, I, I, I mean, I actually drafted that bill, and I was very involved in the drafting of this bill. And I'm not knocking them, but these are pretty cheap measures. You know, what carers need is they need a carer's allowance that is hundreds of pounds, not 60 or quid. They need really good welfare benefits and they need proper pension entitlements, and that's going to cost billions and billions. Um, and what we're getting instead is, is fairly palliative responses. They're, they're not, I'm not locking them, but, you know, radically, something much more than that's got to happen. Um, so. Just quickly running through these, the main act is that act, the Cares Recognition and Services Act. It comes along in 1995. Um, because we're getting this privatisation of care, we're getting assessments, but carers are being left out of assessments. So Carers National Association, it's now called Carers UK, got me to draft a bill for them in 1993. Um, they then look around to find an MP who will put his name in the ballot for the private members' bill. Um, and Malcolm Wicks did it um, in 1994, November. Malcolm came um, high enough in the members' bill to introduce his uh, bill into Parliament. Um, it was actually quite a nice period. Um, I've dealt with all the governments since... Um, John Major's time onwards. And John Major's time, they were the nicest government to deal with. I mean, you know, my heart isn't... You know, I don't vote for that group, but, my, they were a nice government. Um, they were doomed. You know, they all knew they were doomed. They all knew they were going to lose. Um, and so they would just give you anything you wanted, basically. <laughs> um, they were the most... And, and there was somebody, Virginia Bottomley, well, really nice. She helped this thing through. God, I love them. Um, um, so we got this. Now, this is sort of quite poignant. That's Malcolm. He is an incredibly nice man. Malcolm died three months ago. His by-election was last night. It was yesterday. He's Croydon North. Incredibly lovely man. Um, but it became law. Um, and it didn't do a lot. Um, but I think it, it just said that when you're doing an assessment, you've got to consider the carers. When you're discharging somebody from hospital, you know, think, you know, carer. Um, so what it says is that when a disabled person is being assessed, and, and somebody in hospital or, or a dis and this, and we, we argue very strongly that this would be a disabled person of any age. So it covers disabled children as well as adults. Um, so when there is somebody who is having one of these assessments, a community care assessment or a children assessment or a review, and there's a carer providing substantial amount of care, um, then you've got to ask them. Uh, they're not employed. You've got to ask them, and then you assess the sustainability of the caring relationship. I should say that the new legislation, when it comes forward, which is being drafted, will do away with the need for a substantial carer. It'll be any carer, and it'll do away with the request, both of which are not really relevant anymore anyway. So. The government's saying that the new legislation will be good for carers, and, and in some respects it, it, it will be. Um, so how does this work? Well, all you get in, the in this, this is an assessment. So you... 
We've assessed Albert. He's 80, he's got dementia, he lives on his own. His daughter pops in a couple of times a week, but she works. So she can't do much more than she's doing. And that's been okay, but now she's worried because he's, he's becoming very much more neglectful and forgetful. Um, he's not dressing himself properly, he's not bathing himself properly, he's not eating properly, he's wandering. So she asks us to social services to go in. We assess Albert, we work out that he probably needs 24-hour seven care. Um, and uh, we might arrange for sort of a stair lift and sitting service and day centres, that sort of stuff. So he'd get quite a good package. What happens if Albert lives with his wife, but he's got exactly the same needs? How would that work? Well, we would have to offer her a community care assessment. I mean, a care as act assessment. And the, the law says you look at three key areas. You look at autonomy. Um, now, autonomy just means choice in this context. Because, of course, carers must be told they don't have to do it. Because we've abolished the libel family rule on the 5th of July, 1948. So you've got to say to the wife, in this case, or the daughter, you don't have to do this. But are you willing and able to do anything? Um, uh, 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 and that should be put in a neutral way. Do you have a choice over what you do? A lot of carers are providing 24-7. They, they, they have no feeling of choice. You then have to ask them, um, is the caring having an adverse impact on your health and well-being? 56% of all carers have a caring-related health condition. The 6.5 million carers in the UK, so over 3.5 million of them, are suffering ill health because of their caring. Now, that may be a back injury or a lifting injury, but most commonly it's acute stress, anxiety or depression. Half of that group, so over one and a half million carers, have been to see their GP about their caring-related health condition. So caring's not good for you, and it's actually putting a huge strain on the NHS. So we have to discuss that. And finally, there's the what impact is caring having on your other roles? Now, particularly, this is going to be work, education, training, but other social activities. Now, I've just said, if, if, if Albert was living on his own, we might give him that sort of care package. We might say he needs getting up, feeding, dressing, he needs, um, you know, so we'd put in home help, meals on wheels, sitting service, day centre. That would all be under the chronic sickness so persons act, sorry. So, that's what you were saying before about carers having a choice when they live. My father, I've been looking at after like seven, four, five, and a half years, and I had a neck operation, um, my spine operation that went from the throat. I was only, he was only in respite for five weeks, and then you couldn't afford it anymore for him to be looked after, so yeah. to me. And I had a big breakdown. I had no choice, and my no, father was no. taken into a home by social services. And when we, I was very vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. When I was spoken to, I had nobody with me. And then they took him from me. Yeah, and put him yeah. in a home, and which made me very ill. Yeah. So what choice do I have in life? And now I find out that I have to leave my father's home, and they won't even let me let him come home at weekends. Right. That, to me, has been taken out of my hands yeah. as a carer. And I know that's happened to many, many people. Yeah. I mean, what, one of the things that I'm going to come on to briefly in a minute is the fact that, you know, you needed support. You needed advocacy. You needed information. You needed to know what his and your rights were. Um, because this is all very well. But, you know, it's law. It's complicated. You don't, you know, unless you've come across somebody who, who can support you emotionally and, in, you know, inf with information, it's not much use to you. And, of course, now... And it wasn't when that happened. So, you know, I mean, the one thing I think we have seen is a considerable growth in carers' organisations. Uh, and, like, today is witness to that. So, hopefully... You know... I've come today... Yeah. 
to more or less say this is going to stop. Yeah, less, yeah, yeah. Because it's going to keep happening and that. Thing. Well, your classic example of the fact that you can't take any more. You know, you're stretched as much as you could possibly go, it seems to me. And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, we need, I think increasingly people have got to realise that you're not unique, if you see what I mean, you know, yeah. that there'll be many people here who are in that similar situation. Um, and one of the things we're trying to do with this sort of, these YouTube things is because very often disabled people, elderly people, carers, think they're the only person this has happened to. And they come to me and you say, oh, not again, you know, or, or like the hospital discharge or the transition into adulthood, these, these problems. Um, but the more you articulate it, I think the more politically powerful your message becomes. Things have got to change. So, so if Fred was living on his own, or your, your, your elderly father was living on his own, you know, that might have happened. But if Fred was living with his carer, the local authority said he doesn't need home help, he doesn't need meals, he doesn't need sitting services, because when we ask the what if question, what if we don't feed Fred, the answer is, well, he won't suffer harm because his wife does it or his daughter does it. So he doesn't need it. Because, so you often end up with the carer doing everything and the local authority doing nothing. And that's, often, that's called the inverse carer law, that the, the carers that provide the most help get the lead support from local authorities. They're the 24-7 carers. But we can't make that decision that she does everything, his wife does everything, and the local authority does nothing without offering her a carer's assessment. And in that carer's assessment, we'd look at autonomy, health and involvement, and health and safety. And I had a case, oh, 15 years ago, like this. Sorry. Excuse me. I'm a carer for my wife, and I've been assessed. But my daughter helps me yeah. at various times. Is she entitled to an assessment? Yes, she would be. Yeah, you can have m in many assessments, yeah. Thank you. Is that all right? Yeah. yeah. Um, the local authority are normally quite happy to do carers assessments because they've got a target, and, 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 and hopefully that would be, <laughs> you know, the more the merrier. Um, I had a case a bit like this about 15 years ago. Um, elderly woman caring for her elderly husband, he was um, needing 24-7. He was really needed a lot of support. His review is that needs to continue. She's offered a care assessment. She has a care assessment. Autonomy, do you choose to do this? And she was sort of said, yeah, of course I choose to. We've been married nearly 50 years, you know. Of course I choose to do this. It's almost insulting in a way. She said, yeah, obviously I'd like to get away and see my daughter and my grandchildren a bit, but I do choose to do this. Um, on involvement, she was saying, well, I'm not working. Um, I don't get out at all socially, but, you know, I'd like to go shopping or things like that. But no, I think it's my duty in a sort of you know, a very decent way to do this. You know, that's what we do, for better or for worse, and most people would say that, probably. But when it came to health and safety, she paused a long time, and she said, look, that's a huge problem. I've been worrying about this now for three months, because three months ago, my doctor told me she thought I'd had a slight stroke. And she told me that if I don't stop this enormous amount of caring, I'm probably going to have a major stroke and I'm going to end up as disabled as my husband. And she had read her the riot act, basically, and said, you've got to consider putting your husband into a care home because if you don't do that, it's going to kill you. And she said, look, I am never, ever going to agree to him going in a care home. It will just, you know, I would never agree to that. Um, and so she'd lived for three months or so with this terrible dilemma between a rock and a hard place. You know, does she kill herself or does she do the one thing that would, you know, she wouldn't do? Well, that's the carer's assessment. All you get under this act is an assessment. You then look back at his care package and you say, is that sustainable? And the answer is, of course it's not sustainable. She can't carry on doing that. And what happened in that case was the local authority said to her, look, we'll put some help in to get him up in the morning, put him in bed at night, and we'll give you a sitting service once a week, three hours or something, so that we will um, do some of this. And curiously, that was enormously 
important for her because it took the strain off her. Um, she realised there was a middle way, that it wasn't sort of, you know, a stroke or a care home, but the local authority would put in. And the local authority said, you know, we would provide more if needs be. And that just took all the, all the pressure off her in a way, although I thought it was quite a small input. So the outcome of a carer's assessment is not the carer gets anything, because in my view, she didn't need anything. It was his needs that were met a different way. Um, he got the same amount of care, but not all from his wife. Um, so, the, so the idea of a care assessment is not, it's not radical, it's just that his needs are met. Um, okay. Um, Excuse me, sorry, can I just ask, is that funded? Well, once he's once he's assessed as needing that, once that is needed, he has a right to these services. He could be charged for those services because these are community-based services. She can't be charged, obviously, but he could be charged and would probably be charged, um, depending on his income. And of course, charging is becoming the big problem because it's so substantial. Because local authorities are so short of money. It's being cut by government. They're, they're looking around, and, 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 and charges are coming up all of, all the time. <coughs> yeah, I mean, this this the, you're a self funder, um, and that's a problem. Well, often it's, it, it, that's the big issue that the, 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 the local authorities say, well, you're going to have to pay for this, or, or we don't do it because he's a self-funded. In that case, they couldn't say it's easy. They wouldn't do it because, of course, he lacked the capacity to sort it out himself, and she doesn't have to do that. But, yes, the, the self-funder is a, is a huge problem. The only way we're going to sort this out is by having free social care, which is what you have in Scotland, of course. And Scotland have done that without raising taxes. It would cost us, um, the Royal Commission says, 1.7p income tax. It would be about £2 billion. We will have it. Um, as sure as eggs is eggs, it will uh, happen. But at the moment, it's a huge problem. The new social care bill um, will uh, provide for local authorities to help self-funders. But, of course, they still have to pay. But it is a huge problem, yeah. Um, the, 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 the proposals from what we call the Dilnock Commission was to put the, um, the, the cost threshold up to 100,000. But, of course, the government's as keen on Dilnock as it is on Leveson. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to go through...